Please be seated. You know, um, been a little bit of a buzz this week, and a few uh, people have asked me about something. And uh, we talked, this, introduced a, a term this, this past week to, to church, and that term is alpha. And some of you, some of you guys are, are newer to the church, and you have questions. And then there are some of you, I know, because you've told me, you're mostly here because it's important to your spouse or your family that you come. And honestly, you're not always sure what you believe. It's okay, you're welcome here. And for people like you, Alpha is coming to Central. Alpha is a place to have open conversations. It's a place to connect with other people. It's a place to ask questions, even hard ones. And if you have all the spiritual answers, Alpha's probably not for you. Okay. But if you have doubts, or you've not been coming to this church for very long, you owe it to yourself to check out Alpha, which is beginning Wednesday nights, September 11th. It's a small group, and space is going to be very limited. So if you're interested, let me encourage you, stop by the information desk, get yourself registered. Uh, we'd love to be able to have you be a part of that. All right? Yeah. Amen. You guys ready for the word? Yeah. All right, I'm ready to give it to you. I've been excited about sharing this. Amen. It's all right. I can be enthusiastic. I enjoy this. 200 days wages were not enough money to feed everybody. That was Philip's assessment when asked. Jesus expressed concern about this crowd of 5,000 that was coming to hear him and to see the miracles that were going on. And they'd come from far and had not eaten. And Philip said basically, even if we got two-thirds of a year's wages... It wouldn't be enough money, and there's no place around here to buy food for that bigger crowd. And the only person who had any food in the crowd, apparently, was a small boy who had five barley loaves and two fish. I will also say he had a wonderful career ahead in logistics because he was the only one who had enough sense to bring food. But Jesus said something unusual. He told his disciples to prepare to feed them and told the crowd to sit down and get ready to be fed. And then Jesus didn't do anything dramatic. He did not make a prophetic declaration over the fish to multiply. He didn't wave his hands. All Jesus did was he gave thanks. He gave thanks for the not enough there. But he thanked God for the not enough that they had. And men have talked about the miracle for 2,000 years ever since. Because as he gave thanks for the not enough, it became enough. Not only was it enough, it was an abundance. There were 12 basketfuls gathered up of the leftover bread. It was an awesome miracle. And people watched it happen. I mean, they saw it with their own eyes. And they were amazed. And everybody was buzzing about it. Not only were they satisfied in their hunger, but they were intellectually stimulated. I mean, what you just saw was compelling. It was amazing. And they liked it. And so the crowd reacted, and Scripture says when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. And at first glance, that sounds pretty impressive. Oh, they, they, they're giving him the accolades of being a prophet. But, but if you think of it this way, the people immediately do, defined who Jesus was for themselves. They announced, this is the prophet. But Jesus doesn't get defined by popular opinion, does he? Jesus had already been defined by God himself when he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. People still have ideas about who Jesus is, don't they? He's the great prophet. And perceiving they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus again withdrew to a mountain by himself. I, that's got to be one of the most presumptuous acts in all of scripture. Think about it this way. They were going to force him to be king. They were going to force him to be the king they wanted him to be, which meant they wanted to force him to lead a rebellion against Rome's authority, because that's what they assumed the Messiah was going to do. And the truth is this, Jesus was already a king. He didn't need the crowd to make him a king. He was just a king of a kingdom they couldn't see with their eyes, a kingdom not made with human hands. Jesus didn't come to lead a political movement. So Jesus just walked away. He spent a solitary night in prayer, and in the middle of the night, he, his disciples had headed back to Capernaum and Jesus walked across the water to Capernaum. It was one of those stories there of another miracle. But the crowds were still buzzing and they were looking for Jesus. They went back to the place where he had multiplied the food the, the, the previous day and he wasn't there and word spread that he was in Capernaum. And so they went looking for him. When they found him, the scripture says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? 
Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you had your fill of the loaves. Now the first thing I want to point out is Jesus didn't answer their question. Lord, when did you get there? I mean, I'd have kind of gone, y'all didn't see me walking across the water? Wow. You haven't seen that before, have you? He didn't feel compelled at all to do that, did he? But what he did instead was he basically said, you guys are just in this for the food. Now, that doesn't strike me as a way to get everybody to like you. It's not the way to get people to applaud. But Jesus told them, what you guys are doing right now really isn't about seeking God. It's about you, what you want, your needs. And that reminds me that Jesus shows us love in truth in ways that lead us to truth, even, even when it's hard truth. Even when it's not what we want to hear right then. Amen. Right? In fact, what Jesus says to them next is really the most offensive sermon he ever preached. I almost entitled this message, Jesus' Most Offensive Sermon. But I decided that that might not be a really good idea. But, anyway. um, but most of Jesus' followers left him over the message that he preached next. I'm going to read a lot of scripture. Can I do that this morning? I'm going to read a lot from, from John chapter 6. Jesus continued, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe on the one he has sent. So they said, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What work will you perform? Other than multiplying the food to feed the 5,000 that he had did less than 24 hours before. But I digress. Our forefathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Hey, Jesus, can we get another miracle? Except this time, Lord, instead of giving us bread, how about giving us that, that manna stuff that Moses made? That would be really cool, Jesus. We'd like that. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who came down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give us this bread continually. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I tell you, you've seen me and yet you don't believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I'll never cast down. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Amen. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How now does he say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus said, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will draw, I will raise him up on the last day. It's like the third time Jesus has promised that, hasn't it? It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. And truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And then he said this, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Amen. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Amen. And the bread that I will give him is the, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And the Jews disputed and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said, truly, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will live because of me. 
This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, and who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no avail. The words I've spoken are spirit and life. But there's some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew that from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you no one comes to me unless it's granted by my Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, without a doubt, that was the most unappreciated, controversial sermon Jesus ever preached. To his audience, it was offensive. And as a result, Jesus lost most of his disciples. The Greek word there that's rendered in the English as many of his disciples turned back is actually, it's in verse 66, is the Greek word polos, and it suggests the larger portion, over half. Basically, more than 51%. So more of Jesus' followers left him after that sermon than stayed with him. I want you to get that. Jesus' ministry had been growing. Amazing things had happened. The day before, he had fed 5,000. I mean, that's a good crowd, right? A lot was happening. He was getting a ton of attention. And he preached this one word, and over half of his disciples said, can't handle it, I'm gone. And what was this terrible, offensive message about? Bread. Manna. Jesus was calling himself manna. And the religious got offended. Now, I've often thought that the quickest way to figure out if you are religious versus a Jesus follower is by figuring out how often you are offended. That was just a little side note. I can make that a meme this week. But calling himself the bread of heaven, telling people that they needed to eat him, freaked them out. But think about this. What is manna? What is manna? I mean, we first read about manna in Exodus 16. It was this supernatural bread that God gave to feed the children of Israel who were in the wilderness at the time. They were there in the desert and they woke up and there's this bread that's laying everywhere. It looked like a a wafer. The Bible actually describes it in some detail, although none of us actually have held it or tasted it. And, And this supernatural bread was there for them every day. And it fed them for quite a while while they were in the desert. But ask yourself a question, why did he give them manna? And and you may think, well, to feed them. Yeah, but Jesus, I mean, God could have fed them with lots of things. Why did he feed them manna? He could have just said, behold, let the crops come forth from the desert ground. And they would have. Or he could have driven supernaturally a herd of cattle into the, every morning. And they could have had plenty of beef. Or could he could have commanded a caravan of traders to pass by with enough food? He could have caused anything to happen. I mean, you think about it. But according to Scripture, there actually is a very specific reason why God chose to give Israel manna. And it's not what most of us think. The answer is actually in Exodus 16, verse 4. And it says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. And here's what you got to see. Manna was a test of obedience and relationship for Israel. It wasn't just food. It was a test of obedience and relationship. God told them they had to gather that daily. You could not save it overnight. If you've read the passages there in Exodus, you know that if they tried to save it overnight, it was rotten the next morning. Amen. Yesterday's manna was inevitable. inevitable. I don't know, one more time. Inedible, edible. My mouth is against me. <laughs> That's a problem when you're the preacher. Inedible. You couldn't eat it. Only on the Sabbath, on the day of rest, did the manna last overnight. Israel had to learn that there was a discipline. 
They had to get up in the morning. They had to gather their manna for that day. And furthermore, every household had to gather their own manna. There was no professional manna gatherers out there who gathered it all up in the morning and sold it. No, it didn't happen that way. Everybody had to do it for themselves or at the very least for their household. Heads of household could gather manna for their household. And it was a test because it goes against basic human nature. Because basic human nature is, I'm going to get all mine right now and I'm going to put it in the storeroom and I've got plenty. But instead, God wanted them to do it every single day. And they couldn't have somebody else do it for them. Now, Jesus, in this message that cost him, most of his disciples said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he'll live forever. If Jesus is manna, which he said he was, given for our life, then this we know. As Jesus' followers, we must purposefully partake of him daily. Now, this is going to sound like a simple message, and really it is. But it's not an easy one. That we must feed on Jesus daily. Because yesterday's manna is stale and rotten. What we got yesterday, it might have gotten us where we are now, but it's not continually providing nutrition for us. Without a fresh experience with Jesus, pretty much daily, We have spoiled manna. And in our life as a Christian, there is a daily process that I suggest is also a test that we daily receive from heaven. Because God wants a relationship with you every day. He loves you. He likes you. He wants to be with you. It's not a burden when you come into his presence. He likes it. That's what he's about. And for most of us, it's easy in our self-sufficiency, in the busyness of life, to go around on yesterday's manna. By the way, yesterday's manna has another name. Religion. Religion is living according to a shadow of an experience we had yesterday. And we may have confidence in that experience, and we may have confidence in our traditions, and we may have an experience with God in the past. But without a lifestyle that regularly feeds from Him we are really confidently filled with rotting manna. Sorry to gross you out there, but... We must gather and receive the bread of life daily. To be what we're... How many want to be what God's called you to be? How many really want to experience Him? I mean, we're in this for the real deal. Not for religious experience, but to know Him, walk with Him, to really be His followers, not just have the name Christian plastered across our forehead, but to be followers of Jesus. And this is what it is to be a follower of Jesus, having fellowship with him daily. Otherwise, we're in a state of decay. There's really two states. We're either growing or we're decaying. There's no in-between. And this isn't a law. This isn't a yoke. This isn't like a religious bondage to you. It's just a principle of spiritual life. And again, if we're going to be what we're called to be, we have to embrace this principle. In a sense, gathering the bread of life daily is the ultimate test of obedience. It's very interesting to me that this is the message Jesus lost most of his disciples over. He said, look, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And then the gospel writer records in verse 60, upon hearing it, his disciples said, this is hard, who can accept it? And most turned away. And I believe it's safe to say that this is where most Jesus followers, most disciples struggle and even turn away today. And it's a hard saying to feed on his word in the presence of God every day, to take his spirit with you into everyday life, to be spiritually fed through continual prayer at work during the day, to hear his voice in the day-to-day tasks of life. To, to, um, you and I are called to be change agents, to come fresh from the presence of God with that fresh aroma of bread, just like the door just opened to the oven. And we walk in 
to the place of business or the office or the school, the classroom, wherever you are, and there's just an aroma of life about you. Amen. Let me tell you, that does more to change the world around you than you can possibly imagine because we're carriers of him. We have something, we're built up in our hearts and our spirits and our lives. And we have something to give away. We have a, an ability to make people around us have hope Amen. and not just be depressed and discouraged. Isn't this the test that most Christians turn away from? Because I'll just argue this. Most Christians, now I know many of you guys have, I know you, so I know many of you have amazing prayer lives, amazing times in the, in, in, in the things of the Lord. But let's, let's talk about where most people come down in this busy, 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 crazy, busy culture we're all living in. That if we don't learn to reject a little bit of the busyness of the culture, we're never going to be who we're called to be. Amen. All right? And most Christians gather their manna only on Sunday morning. They come to church on Sunday morning and get built up, and then they try to live the rest of the week on that experience. In other words, it's like we're separating our spiritual life from real life. That's not what we're called to do. Real life is where we're living, and we're called to influence and impact and be full of Jesus in the real world, at home, at work, in the marketplace. In the classroom. Now, we all live here. As I look at my own life of discipleship, i got to tell you, the hardest thing in my own spiritual life is daily, continually feeding on the Lord through prayer and his word. And you're probably thinking, well, if you have a problem with it, Pastor, we're in trouble. (laughs) I will just tell you that the more I know Jesus, the more I know I don't know nearly enough. I don't know nearly enough of his depth and the wonders of his word. There's so much more. But I will also say that having time with the Lord and and, and treating it like a spiritual discipline has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. In 1981, I started as a disc jockey at a Christian radio station. I was very, 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 very new in the Lord. Okay, And I made myself a little promise. And the little promise was this. I would not switch on that microphone in the morning until I had spent time with the Lord and read at least five chapters of Scripture. And someone might say, well, that's legalistic. I knew what I needed, and I made a promise to the Lord. I don't care if I got up late and was struggling and ran into that studio at the last minute with a cup of coffee or whatever. I got the five chapters in because I just wasn't convicted to do it. And I will just tell you that to this day, So much of the reason why I can know and recall the Word of God is the very simple disciplines that I developed fairly early in my Christian walk. It was life-changing to me. Sometimes I still, when I quote a passage, I still see it in that old Bible that I used it in those days, and it just kind of lifts off the page to me. Because God was doing something in my life during that season. And forcing myself to be disciplined in reading God's Word is why I know it today. Now, I realize that a lot of times if you tell people, hey, guys, I want to encourage you. You need a regular devotion time with God. You need regular time in the Word. This needs to be a priority. There will be people who will misunderstand and will say, well, he's preaching legalism. He's preaching religion. But I just want to ask you to ask yourself a question. Does America really have a problem today with too much biblical literacy? (laughs) Is that our problem? Is that what's going on? The church is just too much into the Word and prayer. No. On the contrary, very few people read the Bible for themselves. And if people spent more time, well, if people spend more time watching the news than reading the Bible, then they're going to be more angry than excited about the kingdom. And if we spend more time in God's word, we're going to be more excited about the kingdom. Because we're going to have life in us, just not, not anger and not frustration. There's a trend that has been really running for a few years in the American church, and, and it looks like this. If, if you're a young believer, you tend to listen to a lot of podcasts. That tends to be the main thing that you feed yourself from. If you're like 65 plus, you watch a lot of Christian TV. But few spend significant time just reading and enjoying or listening to God's word. And that is ultimately the most powerful thing we can feed ourselves with. We are called to bring the kingdom to Indian River County and the unreached world. And this will require that men and women integrate God's word, prayer, and presence into their daily life. It requires us to be well-fed, and to be transformed people who walk into that office, the shop, the classroom with his word resonating fresh in our hearts. 
And for most Christians, I think it is the ultimate test of faith. Just gathering that manna daily. It takes obedience, and it's kind of like the Nike commercial. Just do it. Just do it. It's significant that no one else could gather the manna for you. Not the Levite, not the teacher, not the preacher. You've got to gather your own manna. And the same is true for us. The same is true for us. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 16, God gave this little insight about the manna test. He said, he gave you manna in the desert, something your fathers had never known to humble you and test you, so that in the end, it might go well with you. How often do you hear me say that God's purposes are always redemptive? There's reasons for it. He wants it to go well with us. He wants us to be who he's called us to be. He wants to strengthen us in remarkable, remarkable ways if we will meet him in that. In that place, we exchange our energy for his. When we're with him, when we're in the word, when we're praying, even those days that it feels like it's, I'm not getting anything. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Let me just take a few final minutes together and For those of you that haven't really gotten into a good habit of having a time on a regular basis in the Word, growing yourself, um, let me give you a few thoughts on what it means to gather, maybe some practical ways to gather manna daily, if I could use the analogy. First of all, you got to start somewhere. If if you start out saying, well, I need to spend six hours a day in prayer, I'm going to get up at 3 a.m., it probably won't last a day. And I tell you that because of this. Idealism is often an enemy. Idealism can be that yoke of religion. So you got to start somewhere. It's better to start with 10 minutes a day than an hour once a month. The important thing is being consistent and growing in it, okay? So start somewhere. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is pick a time of day that works for you. I will say that for probably most people, that's morning, first thing. Um, That's not true of everybody. Some people are more nighttime people. Um, Traditionally, I am absolutely a morning person. I need to get up in the morning. I need to have my time with God. I need to ask him questions. I mean, when I'm praying for you, when I'm praying for this church, it's almost always the morning for me because that's when my everything is working, okay? Now, Tammy's a night person. She tends to be a night person. That said, she reminded me this morning that not only does she read the Bible in the morning, she also reads it at night. (laughs) Which is true. She does. She listens. She listens a ton. I mean, she's got the Bible, like, she's got an ear pod in her ear, and she's listening to Scripture all of the time. It's not hard to do. So pick a time of day that works for you. You know what that is. When you're picking that time of day, make it a priority. Don't let somebody interrupt you, okay? But the third thing I would say is read the scripture, talk to God, and listen to what he says. Don't just dismiss it. Listen. So read, have a little bit of passage, talk to the Lord, and write down things. That would be the fourth thing. Write it down when you listen. Listen. Sometimes you'll go, oh, I'm just making that up or whatever. Let me tell you, those of you who've been doing this for a few years know what I'm getting ready to say is true. I go back and look at things I wrote down years ago. And at the time, it seemed like a little gentle impression or maybe that's me. Maybe I'm making it up. I don't know. And I wrote it down. And then God did exactly letter by letter what he said to me. And let me tell you how that's changed my walk with God because I have learned to listen to those little things and to not just dismiss it and decide, oh, I'm making it up. Because that's how he speaks, especially when we're in the word and it's becoming life to us and stuff's jumping off the page. So write things down. You'll, it'll mean something to you later. The fifth thing is guard that time and value it. If the phone rings, don't pick it up. Amen. It's okay. You know, it's okay to say, I have an appointment. You do. In fact, the appointment that you have is at least as important as the person who's calling you. It's true. So guard that time. It's your date with God. The sixth thing I want to just encourage you is consistency is the key. Just be consistent. I think you'll find it's life transforming. Again, many of you 
already embraced this in your lives. But there's some here this morning that I will just promise you, if you will try this, this is not a new teaching. This is how people of God have been able to change the world around them for generations. When we are full of Him, full of His Word, full of His presence, it transforms who we are. And we have something fresh and life-giving. There is an aroma about our life that is better than walking into Panera at the right moment. Trust me. It's better. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. I am the bread of life. And I, I, I give for the, 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 the bread that I give is my flesh. The trick is that we have to choose to eat it. Would you stand with me? Just looking at the bread doesn't satisfy your hunger. Knowing the recipe for the bread doesn't satisfy your hunger. Taking selfies of yourself with the bread is not the same, right? Telling other people how awesome the bread is isn't the same as eating it for yourself. Nothing will satisfy your hunger except eating the bread for yourself. And whoever eats that bread, as Jesus said like a half a dozen times in that one little passage, whoever does this will live forever. Whoever does this will live forever. That's an amazing promise from the Lord. I want to encourage our prayer team to come down as we all bow our heads for just a moment. I've shared this word with you, and I, I realize that when I share something like this, there's probably a few of you who are going, boy, am I blowing it on this. Listen, what I want you to do is just say, Lord, tomorrow I'm going to begin. Tomorrow. Amen. Or, or it's okay if you do it today too, by the way. Amen. Don't let anything keep you from that, because he will meet you in that place. He will encourage you in that place. He'll transform you in that place. If you have prayer needs this morning, or you want to pray with somebody, maybe you'd say, look, I I know that there's things in my life that I need to change, and I'm not walking with the Lord or knowing God the way I need to. We want to be able to pray with you this morning. If you have a struggle you're going through in a relationship, or you have a struggle in a sickness in your body, God's been with us in this house this morning. We want to be able to pray with you. If you just need some direction in your life, we'll pray with you and believe God is going to speak through that prayer in a way that will supernaturally give you insight and information. So if you if you need a prophetic word this morning, the brothers and sisters you see here around our altar are, are qualified and released by this church to be able to prophesy over you. Okay? So we want to be able to receive that Billy's going to sing a song in just a moment as we worship together. I want to encourage you, whatever needs you have, come forward and just receive that. And if you don't have any needs whatsoever and don't want to take advantage of that, let me just say to all, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. You are those who Jesus has redeemed, and you are those who he has filled with the power of his spirit. The spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is in you. Let everybody see it. God bless you guys.